with WTP Munitions. Another great podcast coming to you. Glad you folks are tuning in this morning. A um, couple things that uh, we'll start off with. Kind of big news. It's been out there just a little bit, but a uh, big discussion that we had this week. Uh, kind of getting excited to hear what's going to happen with the Ruger Marlin combination. Yeah. Um, I know when uh, when it was announced that Ruger had bought Marlin, I was extremely excited because I'm a I'm a big fan of the uh, Ruger brand. Uh, I have been for a long time. I have a pretty big personal collection of the Ruger firearms, and I've seen the other day you posted. Yeah, really yeah, cool I've got quite a few Rugers but, myself. Yeah, and a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, so, just a couple. Just a nice starter kit. Uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was really excited to see this combination coming. Um, what are you what are you kind of expecting out of it, or what are you what are you hoping to see out of it? Well, I guess you know there's always the the obvious you know offerings. You hope they bring back the 1894 line, the 336 line, the you know some of their more um, historic models, and, and keep those at the front of, of their company. What I what I get really excited about, and I know you'll appreciate it too, is the manufacturing capability that they're going to have now behind them. Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, literally, you know, there's there's all kinds of, uh, I've actually, you know, talked to the heads at Marlin uh, the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity to talk to the head of the rifle line when they were trying to do something with the 1894 uh, involved in cowboy action shooting and stuff like that. And, um, you know, when they moved Marlin from the original Marlin facility, uh, Marlin was still essentially hand-making firearms for, yeah. for, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, you know, they were running on machinery well into the 90s and early 2000s that was 40, 50 years old in some cases. Sure. So, um, and still turning out good firearms at that time as right. well. So, right. um, you know, it doesn't mean that's a bad thing. But uh, Ruger's ability to adapt to the market and then the innovations and, uh, you know, their in-house castings, um, just every, everything that Ruger does in-house, I think is going to really bring some awesome things to Marlin. And, uh, um, it's something that I think also Bill Ruger would probably think was pretty cool at the time because he was such an innovator. I mean, um, you, know, you hate to make comparisons, but Bill Ruger kind of was the John Browning of his generation as well. You know, he kind of took existing designs and improved them. And, you know, one of the very first, you know, most people don't know, one of the very first semi-autos that Bill Ruger ever made, he made off of a Savage 99 rifle. Really? You know, clever action. So, I mean, he was, and he was a genius in his own right. So, um, Myself, personally, I'd really like to see them ramp up their 1894 line, both from a, a hunting, home protection, truck gun application, as well as a cowboy action application. Um, you know, and uh, there's, you know, some iconic stuff. Uh, you know, I, I realize that Ruger has their 1022. Well, Marlin has their Model 60. Right. You know, sure. if, uh, if you didn't have a 1022 when you were a kid, you most likely had a Marlin Model 60. Sure. So it would be awesome if they kind of brought that iconic line back. Um, so what, what, what do you think they're going to do from a, like a rifle standpoint? Well, I'm, I'm excited about it, and I'm sure all the Ruger executives are listening to us this morning. So I'm, I'm, sure, they kinda... <laughs> I'm sure we have their ear. Yeah, I hope, they, hope, they, yeah. hope they're listening and, uh, and um, hope they take our advice here on a lot of this. But, right. uh, no, I, you know, I, in a conversation I was having with a gentleman the other day here in the store was that, you know, one thing that I'm hoping and I'm kind of excited to see if they do um a 22 lever action rifle yeah um, the, the henry's have been fantastic love the henry product line um and a lot of their new offerings are fantastic but uh it would be something kind of neat to see is uh ruger step over into uh bringing back some of the iconic uh marlin design mm -hmm. in a new fashion you know a 39 style uh um, lever gun right would be very very cool um from the actual rifle side i think uh you know marlin had something started there with kind of their wilderness look right uh, to some of their firearms um they were kind of looking the right direction i think because every time we've been able to get those in stock uh you know over the past two years or so they they went out almost instantly uh -huh. um, they weren't in stock for very long and so i'm really hoping that ruger comes with something like that which i fully expect them to i mean they've been always very innovative with you know uh, more of a wilderness or a step off gun, you know, right. with everything in their, you know, their number ones, for example. Yeah. Um, and then uh, going into uh, uh, their less expensive line, going into the Ruger American line. So I'm kind of excited to see if they figure out something to cross into Marlin, um, you know, 
maybe labeling it in a bolt action side or if they're just going to lock it into where they're at on the, the lever gun side. Right. But um, very excited to see the options of offerings that they can bring to it. I kind of hope that the stamping on it's something cool to where it's, uh, you know, and that was another debate I was having yeah. with a couple of the older customers in here was, you know, are they going to stamp it Ruger uh, Marlin or are they going right. to stamp it R Marlin or you right. know, how are they going to yeah. do that? Yeah. Are they going to continue the mystery of their barrel stamping? <laughs> so you have, to, you have to have a Rolodex to figure out where the gun was made and what it was made. Yeah, so. yep. Yeah. And we have to pull up about 35 charts <coughs> to uh, figure out uh, exact dating, which is... Uh, right. Yeah, it keeps us busy at times. And you know, the uh, like the eighteen ninety five series. I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, we get an eighteen ninety five and forty five seventy. How long does it sit on the shelf? I mean, it's it's very very short. It's very very short. Mm -hmm. um, and what what's really cool about that is the relationship that Ruger has with Lipsy's and Tallow and Davidson's and the distributors that do exclusive models. I think we can expect some pretty cool exclusive models yeah. eventually down the road yeah. from companies like that. So yeah. it's it's. Of all the things going on in the firearms industry, I think it's one of the cooler things, and and definitely not trying to be a, a Debbie Downer as far as what's going on in our country politically or what may be coming down the pike for us from a firearms um, standpoint. But Ruger has always been really, really good at adapting to whatever situation they're in, yeah. um, and their guns are very adaptable. Yeah. Um, you know, in the event of you know magazine capacity restrictions. You know, um, you know, guys. If 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 we have things like this happen, um, we're going to see trends change. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, lever guns will become cool again. Lever guns yeah. have always been cool. They'll right. just be a little bit cooler. <laughs> so <laughs> right. you know, maybe I mean, to the masses. Now, maybe, absolutely. Yeah, to the masses. Yeah, they've always and, been um, cool to us. Absolutely. Yeah, they've always been cool to us. <laughs> and um, to me, especially, you know, I, honestly, you know, for me personally, you know me, I'd rather have a good lever gun over an AR-15. That's sure. just how I. Mm -hmm. That's how I roll. But sure. um, you know, there's a place for everything. But I think that their adaptability in the market and how they flex to the times, and I think they've done a really nice job of that. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and if uh, you know, and if you and if you watch your, you know, if, I guess if you watch your markets, you'll find that Ruger has done probably better than anybody else over the years. Oh, so, absolutely, and they've, they've done a really great job of the diversification of the line just within the Ruger house. Uh, you know, and you mentioned AR-15s. There's mm -hmm. another thing. You know, Ruger, their their AR-15s are fantastic. Yeah. Um, even their base models are really really great. Uh, better than some other companies yeah. step up models. Uh, so you know, they've done fantastic there. I think if anywhere that Ruger's you know struggled just a little bit in the past would be uh, some automatic defense guns. They haven't ever really hit the mark on it. Um, the, the Are you saying the P95's not the Glock 17 in the world? Well, there's actually quite a follow-up <laughs> to that, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's not, uh, you know, it's it's thousands, not millions. Well, um, yeah. No, and, and you're right, though, because they've, you know, they, they've always made good guns. The sure. P95, P85's, yep. the Americans, the, you know, um, those are good guns. There's yep. nothing wrong with those guns. They just have never they've never been able to really bite into that defensive handgun market. And I would, you know, the, like the Security 9, I think that gun has a ton of potential. Yes. I really do. I mean, it's a Glock 19 sized gun. Uh, it's economical. It feels yeah. good. Um, it just needs just a little bit more. And I don't know if that's a marketing thing or if it's a... I think it's partially the market timing. I think if they would have been able to bring that to market like prior to the 320, Mm -hmm. um, or uh, or some of the Glock new model launches. Okay. Um, if they could have brought it, because it, it's it's I think an underrated handgun. Now it's not, in my opinion, it's not a VP9. No. It's not uh, certain CZ models, you know. Sure. But it's a fantastic everyday polymer framed firearm. Um, had the opportunity to shoot them. I think they're they're yeah. really really good gun. Actually, I have a shipment of them on the way. Um, that's the gun that, that I feel good selling to somebody. Absolutely, that, that, that wants to keep the price point down a little yep. bit. You're getting in, you're getting them into an American made firearm that, that feels good too. Yep. So. Now, one that they did, uh, you know, in the handgun side of things, brought out and it kind of uh, barnstormed the market a little bit for the followers of the 5.7 by 2.8 yep. was the Ruger 5.7. Uh, that's been a fantastic popular gun as we get them in. Um, we just got. Uh, like three batches in a row here recently and they they almost all went out I think I've got one or two left 
uh, but uh, those batches went pretty quick. Neat, neat firearm. Feels good, looks good, looks different on the market. You know, of course, really the only thing you're comparing it to would be the FN, but, right. uh, but they've done some ergonomic changes on it that are fantastic. Uh, really, really like that gun, and, and uh, we'd like to see more offerings in the 5.7 in the future, because I'm just intrigued by the round. I don't know um, how practical it is as an everyday round, but to be able to have something that's holding 20 rounds is pretty, right. pretty fun. Yeah. There's a lot of fun involved in that. Um, and then, of course, their, you know, their revolver line stands alone. Oh, uh, on itself. You know, I mean, there's Absolutely. you're either a Colt guy, a Smith guy, or a Ruger guy. Yeah, you know, I'm true. I'm all three, but I, I definitely own more Rugers than I do anything else. Sure, but, and that's so, a good point because I have, you know, on my side, I'm mostly Ruger. Um, I, I uh, Ruger and a, a few Colt handguns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. When you when you mentioned that, I kind of think about that. So, yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, and what's I guess what's been interesting to watch just from an observer and enthusiast collector standpoint is in the last 20 years Ruger has come into its own from a collecting standpoint you know 20 years ago there were guys that appreciated some of the 50s and Rugers from the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and there were guys that were fans of the flat top and stuff like that well now there's collectors you know of of the you know you've seen that grow and guys that are actually going after and seeking out specific Rugers and um, you know the, and the prices have absolutely reflected that yeah you know, yeah, and uh, and so. like I explained, you know, to people in the store sometimes when we talk about the quality of guns, the thing that, uh, that I kind of equated to is, you know, everybody refers back to Colts, uh, the Pythons, the original Pythons, mm -hmm. the original, the original snake gun line, and you know, kind of the way I look at that is that was Colts moment in time where they had the very best people employed. Right. Um, they had armors coming, you know, that were veterans from World War II, from, you know, Korea, from Vietnam, armors, people really into the shooting industry, hands-on, that was the industrial age of, of hands-on, fine-tuning by hand. Uh, they produced really, really fantastic guns, and it was kind of the uh, all-star team, if you will, in the firearms industry at the time that produced those. Right. Uh, now Ruger has kind of come into its own, in my opinion, to where they're producing incredibly fine firearms. They're just using modern technology to do it. Right. And they're kind of, um, well, I won't say in just my opinion, because you can just go to the stock market and look at their stock price, but right. Uh, right. you know, they are a performing company with a lot of uh, financial backing within themselves. Uh, they're financially strong. They're uh, producing really good guns, albeit by more modern technology mm -hmm. than the hand file. Right. Uh, so. I'm, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen with all this. Yeah, and that's, you know, and, and you know, guys, any time you get into mass production of anything like that, especially when you're when you're dealing with a firearm that's not all polymer, yeah. um, you know, you've got to understand that they're they're also trying to build these guns efficiently, sure. you know, as quickly as possible, um, you know, and with as with as less amount of man hours as they can as, as possible. So, um, you know, when you're looking at the modern guns of today, those are just things to kind of keep in mind when you're observing it. You know, I mean, it's, you know, they're not all going to feel like your granddad's, you know, Cobra sure. from, from the 60s because they're just, they just don't do that. Right. You know, right. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we're both huge Ruger fans, as you guys can tell pretty right. much. But uh, when we're, right. you know, we get excited about it. But uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to see how, how they blend going back to the Marlin, how they blend both companies. Sure. So, absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right, well, we'll move forward here a little bit. A uh, little quick uh, commercial here. Uh, WTP Munitions is the main sponsor for our podcast and our YouTube videos. Uh, go to WTPMunitions.com. Take a look at the current inventory offerings. Watch for ammo drops. Uh, there again, because of the pandemic, everything's having to be dropped at certain times. And uh, when production uh, is there, then we can drop ammo onto the website. We announced that on our Facebook page and Instagram. Yep. So start following us there if you want to know when ammo's in stock and you can jump on there and purchase things. Uh, there's other items on our uh, site also for you to go on and take a look at and uh, I'll let you go take a look at them without telling you exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. So then that way you, you are taking a look at it. Uh, remember too, if anybody is coming to EOT and the Indiana State shoot this year, June and July, uh, you can go on and pre-order your ammunition. 
yep. and uh, have it here waiting on you when you arrive, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, and then uh, you don't have to travel with it, don't have to worry about it being shipped, you don't have any shipping fees as far as it having to be shipped to your house, and nobody, uh, can, no porch pirates can steal your animal off your front porch. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, <laughs> here waiting exactly. on that. Um, also brought to you by Two Bear Arms Gun Shop, uh, the home of our podcast. Uh, we're yeah. in the, uh, our podcast room within the building. Um, go to our website, tbagunshop.com. Take a look at uh, our hours, information, and offerings there. And then uh, Paradise Pass Gun Club, our Cowboy Action Shooting Club. We also hold summertime events in non-pandemic times uh, and training classes and such down there. So ParadisePassRegulators.com. Okay, enough with the commercials. Into the next topic. I want to talk a little bit, Deuce, um, you know, right now with the shortage of ammunition. Now, there again, our store stocked pretty well with it, but still limits on what people can purchase. So... It cuts into people's ability to uh, practice. I know it has mine. Of course, I don't practice that much. You know that. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> right. But still, I, the other day I did want to go out and shoot a little bit on the range, and uh, instead of shooting an entire box of ammo, I shot half a box of ammo. So, uh, what's your thoughts here on the current status, and what kind of practice can people be doing, both for cowboy and and personal defense side of things? Right. Well, you know, obviously the current state of ammunition. Uh, or component availability is is uh, both you know curtailing people both in supply and economics. Yep. So um, you know I can tell you you know just speaking from you know the cowboy action side of things, which has been my specialty um, in competition shooting, but it can be applied to any type of co competition shooting. The bulk of even even when you could get primers everywhere, the bulk of my practice has always been dry fire. Okay. Um, it's quick, it's easy, it's clean, um, it's something you can do at home. Um, and you know, the whole, the whole dry fire thing, um, what people have to keep in mind is that what you're doing with dry fire is you are literally training yourself, the muscle memory, you're trying to instill that into your brain in the mechanics. It's all about the mechanics, okay? Um, people are like, well, dry fire is not gonna make you a more accurate shot, it's not gonna make you a better shooter. Yeah, yes and no. Okay. I guess in theory, it's not going to make you a more accurate shot, but what it is going to do is it's going to eliminate any of the uh, body mechanics or muscle memory mechanic issues that you will have when you live fire, okay. which in turn allows you to focus on the things you need to be focusing on, which is you know your, your crisp front sight, your trigger control, and things like that. So it actually does make you a more accurate shooter because it removes... You know, you're not worrying about what you're doing with your hands and how you're getting that all done. You're able to focus on, on trigger control, sight picture, and things like that. Um, and of course, you know, can, you know, competitively speaking, um, anymore. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't. There, there was a time in my life when I was when I was probably shooting somewhere between forty and sixty thousand rounds of live ammunition a year, and I know there's guys that eclipse that competitively. But at the time, that was a, that was a lot of live ammo. Sure, and uh, I can tell you that because I was loading it all. Right. So it's uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, my, my wife was also practicing at that time too. So it was right. a we were we were you know selling out a lot of ammo at that time. But um, honestly, I've I've always gleaned the most benefit from dry fire. And we talk when I talk about dry fire with shooters, I I stress too that you don't need to do dry fire marathons. Okay. I mean, if you dry fire for an hour, mm -hmm. it's too much. Okay. You're going to get tired. Okay. You're going to get, um, you know, I encourage people to do, to do more, to do higher volume, less time. Okay. So if you're going to, you know, let's say you put your hands, hands on your guns at least four or five times a week, make them 15 minute increments. Okay. Cause you know, we all get bored, you know, you're going to pet the dog or, you know, when your kids runs in the room or something happens or, you know, the wife says dinner's ready, you know, whatever. It keeps those it keeps those sessions short and it also keeps you focused because I know if I dry fire for more than 10 or 15 minutes I start twirling my guns and doing stuff that I was <laughs> doing when I was six years old so you get, you get bored very quickly uh, so um, you know and I can get, picture you with your holsters and boxer shorts and twirling oh, your guns that's, so. have, do you have a yeah. camera in my house <laughs> are you spying on me um, that totally happens but uh, you know, guys, we keep it fresh, and um, you know, one of the things that I that I do when I actually get into a dry fire routine is I'll have some flash cards, um, just very simple index cards that I write 
things that I want to work on specifically, and I'll flip one over, and that'll kind of you know, get your mind going. And um, kind now, of, is that sequence based, or is that like two plus two is four? Well, you know, sometimes there's pictures on it. You know, <laughs> okay. it's uh, you know, it's, it's I'm a simple creature. Yeah. But uh, I don't like to overcomplicate things. <laughs> but now, you know, in a lot of, um, I think a lot of shooters. You know, no matter what sport you're practicing for, one thing to always remember, too, guys, is that you're doing things that keep you within the legality of what your rules are within the game. Okay. Because that is the time to to um, really instill in yourself. You know, I know I don't know the specifics of it, but I know like USPSA and stuff like that. They're super super tight on on you know finger in the trigger guard and you know. If there's any movement in the stage and stuff like those are the times to start instilling those things in yourself so sure. that's something you don't have to you know the last thing you want to worry about when you're at a competition is am i doing this right am i doing something that's going to get me a dq right well good practice will ensure that those things don't happen right. because i mean there's nothing worse than driving four hours getting a hotel room showing up the next morning for your first big match and the first stage out you dq because you're so nerved up about the mechanics portion of it that you do something that you know that gets you out of the match. Sure, so, um, you know that's that's what I can encourage. And you know, you, we could talk for hours on specific techniques and. Well, to help out new shooters, because I know you know I've been contacted a lot by uh, new shooters to come here to Paradise Pass, and then also new shooters asking about coming to EOT, not, maybe not as participants, but watching that type of thing. Um, they're trying to get into the sport. I think, you know, we have a shoot here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a couple of new people coming. Uh, one of them may be shooting the match. The other one, I think, is coming to watch. And there may be others. Those are just a couple of them that I talked to. I think you talked to one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were to give them, you know, a couple minutes of advice as far as starting out, I mean, do they want to start out with rifle, pistol, shotguns all geared up and everything, or are they wanting to specifically work with one gun at a time? What's your suggestions there? Um, I think the the biggest thing that shooter that new shooters struggle with right out the bat is not necessarily the very specific mechanics of it. It's the gun handling in general. Okay. You know, um, you know, how do I pick this gun up? How do I draw this gun? How do I reholster this gun? Those are all things that I would encourage them that they need to work on the most because those are where, um, they're, those are where the largest mistakes can be made. Um, you know, and that's you know, like if you're, you know, for example, our one seventy rule. You know, those are th those are that's when a new shooter might break the 170. So if you're going to practice anything, I think just general gun handling, pickups, set downs, draws, reholsters. And should be, they be practicing this from a slower pace, or should they be trying to practice this at speed? I would I would definitely start slow. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's uh, people get, you know, it was. Um, you know, one of the first person, one of the first people I ever heard say, it, you know, smooth is fast was Evil Roy. Okay. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that was 20 years ago, and it was kind of a new concept, and um, and that is correct. Smooth is fast, right. but I can also tell you from a competitive standpoint that eventually, fast is fast. <laughs> so you know, you, you do have to, you know, I I've seen a lot of shooters make the mistake of becoming so mechanical. And so methodical and so smooth that they're actually putting a governor on themselves from a speed standpoint you know and, and there's very few of these action games guys no matter what you're shooting that aren't speed based sure. you know they're like you know well, speed you know speed's great but accuracy's final you know why mm -hmm. said that and everybody always references that well right. we're not talking about shooting somebody in saloon we're talking about competitive shooting sure. so um speed and accuracy are final in that game and you can do both um, but uh, for a new shooter, I absolutely would encourage, you know, more methodical, more methodical movements at first, and then ramping it up as you get more comfortable. So, and should they be using a timer while they're doing this, or is it? Uh... You know, the timer. Um, I have not, and and there's, I get asked about this all the time. I have not been. I I rarely ever work with a timer, okay. no matter what I'm doing. Okay. Um, because, you know, in our sport in particular, we don't shoot standardized stages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your starting positions vary. You know, you could be seated at a card table or you could be sitting in a wagon or in a jail cell. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of hard to practice for wow, every... Wow, you're an old school right there. Well, I totally <laughs> went old school, you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it, or you could be standing in front of a card table, and you know, it's a stand and deliver stage. Sure. But um, you know, I, I I don't work with I I work with a timer. I worked with a timer much more years ago than I do now because I know I I know the realm in which I'm doing stuff in. Uh, people get very very obsessive with shot splits, first time shots, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like for example, I I can't even begin to tell you what my first shot time is from holster. I, I think I, I have an idea of where it is, but I can't tell you exactly um, because uh, you know it you know it might depend on how many cups of coffee I had that morning. So <laughs> sure. you know, I mean, yeah, guys. I mean, that's and that's another thing, guys, that I'll touch on because it's very important to me is because um, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm on a lot of the Facebook groups not only for cowboy action shooting but some USPSA stuff and. Um, a good friend of ours, Brandon Whitten, mm -hmm. runs one of the Facebook groups for uh, for the action sh uh, pistol games. Yep. Um, keep it fun. Yeah. Okay. The percentage of people that are actually going to um, win money, if that's a possibility in the game that you're shooting, or get any kind of major sponsorship, is so low that it's you know it's obviously respectable and it's a great thing to strive to do the best that you can. But if it becomes a work. It becomes work or a job for you, then you're gonna you're going to lose interest in it eventually, right. or you're going to become haggard with it. So keep it fun, guys. Um, I cannot stress that enough, and, and especially talking to cowboy shooters, you know, it's it really is about the experience at the end of the day, um, you know. And I'll just I'll just touch on it. Um, you know, one of one of my for me, one of my larger accomplishments is winning the winter range mm -hmm. um, in 2010 and in 2017. Um, the first year when I won in 2010, you know, it's, it's the largest action shooting game in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, and it also happens to be a pretty challenging and tough match. And what put it in perspective for me was, you know, I had, I had won my category there before, but I had never won overall. And a shooter came up to me after after the match, a fellow shooter, and he said, "Hey, congratulations, two years in a row." Okay. And I'm like, mm, "No, I've never won the overall." Right. And he's like, "Oh, I thought you won the overall." Oh, well, congratulations. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that kind of puts everything in perspective. Um, right. Make sure you you know, everybody has their own reasons. Do it do it for what you want to do it for, right? And uh, do do it for yourself and enjoy it and keep it fun. Yes, yeah, so. and that's what I tell a lot of new shooters. You know, they're, every new shooter, and I, I, I think everybody that's ever shot cowboy, their first match or two, they were nervous. Maybe yeah. their first 10, 15 matches, they were nervous. But brand new shooters that have never shot it before, I tell them, you know, hey, you got to understand, nobody else is paying attention to how you finish. Right. You know, I, I can't tell you, heck, I can't remember where I placed the last few matches, you know, right. in, in general, uh, let alone 20 other people. You right. know, where did they finish? Um, yeah, so they, they need to uh, just focus on having a good time, being safe, and shooting their own game. Mm -hmm. um, from the personal uh, practice standpoint or from the personal defense standpoint, you know, we do a lot of private training classes here. Um, I was just working with uh, one of our customers the other day, and uh, you know, I was explaining to her that one of the techniques that for defensive carry that uh, I wish people would practice more is obviously empty firearm. Practice at home drawing from the holster. I think uh, there's a lot of lag time, you know, they want to practice the accuracy of the shots, which is very important uh, to get that uh, down pat on the range when you can live fire. But that time from the holster to target is extremely important in a defense situation. And uh, so if I was to recommend anything for anybody to practice uh, there again, dry fire technique at home is that uh, speed from holster and putting it on target. And uh, we are looking into some laser sighting systems. Uh, I had the staff yesterday researching one um, and we'll be making a decision here in the next few days, probably carrying one of the laser sighting systems that people can dry fire and practice with. Because there again, it does go down to ammo consumption at this point for a lot of folks. Um, you know, obviously we notice people uh, still coming in wanting to shoot on the range. Uh, they're just not shooting as much on the range. Right. Uh, either one, because of the limitation on the amount of ammo they can purchase, or they're just not burning up all the ammo that they purchased that day, so they have a little reserve for the next time that they come. But, um, you know, there is some blue sky at the end of this. I think at some point here, you know, we're starting to see 
uh, more firearms available and a little bit more ammo. I, I've got several cases of ammo from one of the distributors the other day. Uh, it'll be here, I think, today, actually, uh, to add to what we already have. And firearms, it's now to the point, you know, a month and a half ago, I was, uh, when reps were calling to offer guns, I was pretty much taking everything they, they, they were offering me. Uh, and then yesterday I took probably, well, this week I would say I probably took 60% of what they offered me um, because we were just getting ourselves stocked back up. There's enough reps calling with enough offerings that uh, now we're getting to pick and choose uh, again back to the really, really good stuff that we're going to have on the shelf, which is pretty awesome. But that's for another topic for another day. Okay, so... Um, Leading into the next set of topics here, uh, we will announce that we do have a special guest uh, that will be doing interviews of next week and uh, posting a video shortly thereafter. It'll be kind of exciting. I don't know if we want to say any more about it nope. than that. It's a very special okay. guest. Very special guest uh, will be here in the podcast room with us next week. We'll in, person. Here, in person. Live, live in person. In person. Live. Uh, right here. So... Um, okay, next topic, uh, well, I wanted to mention social media-wise. Uh, make sure that you're following us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and then your favorite podcast provider. Um, you know, we always recommend Spotify. Uh, that's where our hosting begins for our podcasts and then uh, filters out to the other podcast locations. So uh, follow us on all those. Go to our Facebook page for Two Bear Arms and also for WTP and uh, follow and like those. Uh, we're, we're putting information on there daily. I think yesterday we did two or three posts uh, on Two Bear Arms. Great information, and there's also some good uh, comic relief that goes on there also. But uh, next topic, uh, we'll move into some of the, uh, the SAS news, I guess is the way that we'll put it. I um, wanted to talk just for a minute about Founders Ranch. Uh, the announcement came out this week. Misty Moonshine put out the information about Founders Ranch uh, closing as far as operations for SAS. Um, I wanted to kind of clarify a little bit because I know there was a lot of uh, phone calls, text messages, a lot of uh, different forum groups and things that were discussing this. Uh, people need to understand a couple things. Number one, there was never going to be an EOT there this year. Uh, it doesn't make a difference what would have happened, uh, but with COVID, they were not going to be allowed to have EOT there. So um, the, the whole uh, situation with Founders Ranch was not because EOT was not there. Um, it uh, since uh, SAS has moved on to the ownership of Misty Moonshine, and the Wild Bunch is retiring out through uh, through the redemption program. Uh, the Founders Ranch is actually owned as a private corporation uh, by the Wild Bunch, the original Wild Bunch, and. So it's a separate corporation, and SAS is a separate corporation. So the two corporations are still friends. They still get along great. You know, everybody, you know, uh, the Wild Bunch is coming here for EOT, which is fantastic. Really excited. About I'm that. super excited. The, the entire Wild Bunch is coming. The here. entire Wild Bunch is coming here for <coughs> EOT, and we're hoping to be able to bring them into the podcast room and maybe do some interviews. Yeah, that would be, be great. Fantastic. Be great. Um, we haven't got that set up yet, but we're going to work on that. Yeah. Um, hopefully, we'll do a ton of interviews that week. Um, a lot of shooters that. To West Coast and right. South and that type yeah. of thing, but um, but understand, there's no f fracture or friction or anything of that nature here in this agreement. It's just smart business on everybody's part. Uh, Founders Ranch, you know, it's a, it's a 400 acre property, and uh, it just wasn't feasible for SAS to manage and maintain that uh, going forward for basically one massive event a year. Right. Now, if somebody else, you know, wants to purchase it, lease it, do whatever for the purpose of the ski shooting or, you know, cattle ranch or whatever they want to make it, strike gold, I don't know. But it's a separate corporation. They're going to do their thing. SAS is doing its thing. But uh, I wanted to just kind of dispel the rumor a little bit that there was some sort of fracture or some sort of bad blood. This was never the situation. This was always part of the structured plan that uh, everything was moving through. And it just makes sense for both organizations to be able to do that. And like I say, everybody's still friends. Everything's right. still good. Um, there's no major economic impact to either organization. It's just the direction that the two organizations are going. It's, it's not a big deal. So, and just, you know, I guess I'll just add in just because 
you know, I don't, I don't comment uh, very much on SaaS stuff on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I tend to like to stay out of it as far as that goes. But um, I do see a lot of uh, comments, which in themselves may not be posed as questions, but they are questions mm -hmm. because they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, guys, again, it, it's been established that uh, End of Trail is moving to Phoenix, right. Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what was winter range is going to become end of trail in 2022. Yeah, and okay, and that that was great. that's in the plan. That was in the you know that announcement was made. Yeah. Um, you know the new winter range will be in Oklahoma, right. which is what is now land run. Yeah. Okay, and these are all things, guys, that were that have been announced already and have been planned, but there still be, seems to be some. And you these know. were all planned prior to them having to decide to not have the OT this year at Founders Ranch. So right. it wasn't like these were secondary plans. These yeah. have always been the plans, guys. These have been the plans since last year when <clears throat> it was announced that Misty was taking over. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's no conspiracy theory here. There's no secondary rumors to it. This is just business, guys. Yep. And it's all going forward, and everybody's happy about it. Right. I, you know, um, for the membership that you know wants to scream the sky's falling it's it's not no, it's everything's not. <laughs> everything's just like it's, it was planned to be supposed to be and happening exactly like it uh, needs to be yeah so, absolutely and you know and I, and I like i said i'm still seeing you know my votes for indiana yeah. well we are having it we are right having here. a one time one, event one folks. time event understand okay. that too because yeah. i've been asked that oh how often is it coming back here but, you know, number one, we haven't had the first one yet, yep. uh, and this is the first and last one here. Yeah. It's yeah. east of the Mississippi this year, which is fantastic. Um, we're glad we're in a position to be able to help SAS out to be able to hold the event here. Yeah. Um, it all happened kind of quick, but uh, the other option was to not have an EOT this year, right. and uh, we didn't feel that that was a good option. We want to be able to give the members their world championship. Uh, even if it's in a different and a limited fashion to a certain extent, but uh, we're going to put on a great event. We're going to uh, we're pulling out all the stops to put on just an absolute world class event here. It will be a lot different uh, as far as the look and feel of everything compared to what uh, you see in New Mexico. We have green grass here. Yeah. Uh, we also have mosquitoes, which would be fantastic. Uh, they'll make their, their texture the state bird. It, 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 it is. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. But uh, yeah. uh, we have the fly planes coming in to spray for them ahead of time. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, we're going to have, we'll have a full grip on that situation. Yep, so, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, yeah. but we'll, uh, you'll be camping, those that are camping here on site, they'll be camping, and I've been asked that, you know, what's your camping situation as far as what the grounds look like. You're going to be camping on nice, beautiful, manicured grass. Yep. Uh, my wife, Aunt B, she takes it very serious when the weather breaks here. In fact, I'm getting her mower out later today. Uh, and getting that uh, ready to go so in the next couple of weeks she can start mowing. And this place kind of looks like a golf course. Yeah. Um, and she burns up thousands of gallons of gas each year mowing this place, yeah. to my demise. So bring your golf clubs because we need shotgun targets. <laughs> there you go, absolutely. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, you're going to, you're going to, I hopefully have a great time here. Weather should be fantastic. Um, we've got uh, a lot of layout stuff that we've already completed and got things uh, organized and figured out. And uh, we're really excited to have the event. Like I say, we're working on it daily, mm -hmm. um, starting now, uh, starting weeks ago, I guess. Yeah. And uh, we're going to run our, we're going to run ourselves ragged all the way up into June to make sure this is a great event. And there again, uh, June 18th uh, through the 26th is EOT. Um, some members got moved off the waiting list and onto the active shooter list, which is fantastic. Uh, we're very excited. Congratulations to all those that got on. We know there's still a pretty good sized waiting list, and uh, I expect a few more probably to be moved over, but it's starting to get down to the point that, you know, it's the list. Um, and, uh, you know, we apologize we couldn't accommodate, you know, 800, 1,000 shooters. I think we could have maybe got to that number, but. Uh, the problem being is we wanted to put on a world-class event for the ones that could attend, and we had to put a limit on it just uh, for logistics purposes, the time frame that we had to get everything set up and, and operating here. And we just uh, felt it would be a much better event limiting it than trying to pack the house mm -hmm. completely full and uh, maybe not put on as good of an event. So I hope everybody understands. Um, it, uh, 
it, uh, it's going to be a great event, and we're excited about it. So other events you can attend this year here. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking, you know, when do you monthly shoot? Uh, I'm getting a ton of emails on that. Uh, we, you can go to our ParadisePassRegulators.com website. You can see all our scheduled events. You can see information about EOT. You can see uh, photos. We have lots and lots of photos posted on there. There's even a drone view there. We're going to update the drone view here in a few weeks when the weather turns really nice. Uh, Bobcat's going to come in and do some flyover for us and uh, set up another brand new fresh video so you can see some of the new stuff that we have here. There's a video that we have posted it's a couple years old. Um, but uh, um, we shoot first Saturday of every month. Year round, uh, we've only we've been shooting here for 15 years now, and I think we've only canceled uh, three times uh, in 15 years, three monthly events in 15 years, and that was basically just because of snow and cold, uh, which Indiana unfortunately gets plenty of that. Uh, during the winter you months. guys aren't quite as tough here as you are in Michigan, and we were up there. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, yeah, I'm having to adapt to the Hoosier Nancy lifestyle. So, nice. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you moved to me. I didn't move to you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Just so well, you know. It's so kind yeah. of the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll take my governor over yours any day. But that's oh, where well, that's a to totally <laughs> different subject. So yeah. <clears throat> we we can hit the po let's do the politic one in a couple weeks. Yeah, let's do it. Politic one. Just blow the doors off of it. Sure. Like yeah, we can do it. But yeah. All right. Uh, and we'll do my governor versus your governor. Well, no, you're a leader now. Well, anyway. We'll I'd have that. to be a fan first. <laughs> okay. So, fair enough. Unless it's a, like a more of a critical view. I fair guess enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But, Other events coming up here at Paradise Pass uh, in May, May 22nd and 23rd, we've got the Make Black Powder Great Again match. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is a spinoff from our old Indiana Black Powder Guild that we used to have. And uh, for many years, we also held the International Black Powder Championship here, which we uh, we uh, released and allowed to go to Florida. And mm -hmm. Florida is doing a fantastic job down there with it. We're really happy for them and heard that they just had a fantastic shoot down there, which is exciting. I'm going to make it down there one of these days. Um, for that event, but uh, May 22nd and 23rd, Black Powder only event. There again, go to our website, you can see information about it. Go to the Facebook group, you can see information about it. And then uh, the probably the best, biggest news is right after EOT here, uh, starting uh, the first week there of July. So July 4th weekend, we'll be holding the Indiana State event here. Uh, so four days after EOT ends, we start the Indiana State. Which yes. Why not? We've got everything out already. Why not? We're already yeah, exhausted at that point. Yeah, why, why not? Why not? Just, you know, don't put stuff away. Let's just roll right into it. There we you go. Know, there we can go. sleep and we're dead. There we it's go. Fine. There we go. I'm yeah. taking a long vacation right after. No, you're not. You, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, I put in my vacation request and I approved it. Yeah, well, I heard your boss is difficult. So. <laughs> okay, maybe. Anyway, uh, yeah, the Indiana State, now we will be resetting the entire range. Um, you know, we're going to have new target sequences, mm -hmm. new props. Uh, so in that four days, we'll make a major transition, but the Paradise Pass crew is a fantastic crew. We're very blessed here with a very, very large crew. Our crew, um, our official crew is at 32 members right now, um, which is pretty fantastic. But those are the, the, uh, the backbone of this organization here are locally. And uh, that's one reason that uh, EOT is not that overwhelming of a task right. for us because we have such an incredible crew of helpers and then we have additional volunteers that just volunteer you know uh, on a limited basis but our main crew is 32 members so that's pretty pretty exciting to have that uh, that backing but they'll help us reset the range we'll be all reset for the state shoot we'll be ready to go for it and uh, we invite you to stay over i know we've been getting a lot of applications folks staying over for both events or staying for eot you're welcome to leave your camper set up exactly where you have it right here um you know nothing else needs to happen there we do have uh the septic company coming in for pumping we have uh we have them coming in to add fresh water to campers, and uh, I'm working on getting a gas supplier to even come here and be able to fill up RVs and such. Oh, so nice. that's something else I'm working on. I haven't got it done yet, but I will. So, all right. So, anything else you want to add to that before we move on? Nope. I just, uh, you know, I guess rounding it out, guys. You know, we've shared, you know, some news on Founders Ranch and of Trail, uh, and the changes that have been made, the changes that will be made. And again, um, you know, we're, I know that we're both very excited, too, to see what, uh, what End of Trail looks like in Phoenix. 
and uh, it's going to the very capable hands of the Winter Range crew with Black Jack Zach and his yeah, absolutely. awesome uh, Arizona Territory Rough Riders. And, um, and then in Oklahoma, the National Championship with Flat Top Oak, Oakey and Missouri May and their crew. Yep. So um, they're going to do great things. Uh, yep. uh, very established events already, yep. fully capable of putting on world class events. So uh, we're excited about that as well. I'm so. super excited, and I'm going to try to make it to both events. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm very yeah. excited to go out there. Yeah, and somebody just got a new camper, so we can do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we're going to load her up and head out. Yeah. So. All right, folks, another uh, quick commercial here, WTPMunitions.com, main sponsor for our podcast events that take place uh, that you're listening to now that we're having a great time at. And then uh, Two Bear Arms Gun Shop. Dot com. Take a look at uh, take a look at our hours information posted on there. We do firearms transfers, gunsmithing, and custom holster builds. We're going to do one on. We're going to do a podcast on custom holsters here. Yeah, that'd be too. great. So, sure. That'd be great. Fun and, uh, so go onto those websites, follow us on the social media, folks, and we'll lead into our next topic here. And this is something that uh, that uh, kind of fun every every podcast. We'll do a little something about uh, some old guns, yep. some old favorites. Yep. So yes, we'll just uh, I've got one back here. Let's okay. see if I can grab it at this angle. Uh, so uh, this, take me out with it. Yeah, <clears> these are, uh, this is one of our old favorites, uh, guys. This is a 1903 Springfield rifle and 30 out six internal mag rifle holds five rounds. These were adopted by the, mil uh, by the U.S. military in uh, June of 1903. I'm not going to get super technical. Um, these guns were replaced by the M1 Grand in 1936, um, but the 19 1903 did see service um, all the way up through the Vietnam War yeah. uh, in, one, in one way, shape, or form, or another. So uh, World War I, World War II, um, Korea, uh, Vietnam. So it saw saw action in all of those conflicts and wars. Um, you know, a very rugged rifle. Um, you know, this one in particular. This one's actually a Remington variety, made yeah. in 1943. So yeah. kind of a, a, a late production gun in, in a pretty darn good original condition. Um, this comes from an older gentleman that was an army officer himself, and this was in his private collection. Okay. Um, so very clean rifle. Very popular guns even today. Um, you know, this is a gun that you saw. Uh, sporterized a lot too. Yes. Um, you know, in the last hundred years, um, you know, obviously, you know, at the end of a war, there's always surplus, and uh, so you know, this action, these rifles, we, you know, you and I, um, you know, we have the opportunity to look at a lot of collections and a lot of different things, and we quite often see O3 Springfields that have been sporterized and were used in the in the woods to hunt yeah. whitetail or whatever with too at the time. So, right. Right. Um, yeah, we seem to always have at least a few of them in stock. I know this one just came in, and, yep. and it's on the shelf then normally. But uh, yep. uh, yeah, they're beautiful guns, and yeah, there are several different configurations been done to them. Uh, some of the sporterizing that's been done to them is pretty awesome to look at the old gunsmithing uh, skills that some of them have been sporterized to, and that's one thing that uh, in a lot of modern guns you don't get to see that level of sporterizing uh, the firearms, and so. No, and that you know this is this is wood and steel, guys. So this is you know this is the kind of stuff that kind of gets gets me cranked up, and uh, you know it's it's a different air end gun making as well. And you know this was this was their answer to the to the Mauser at the yeah. time. You know that they, they were they were using the thirty forty Craig at the time. They transitioned into the O three Springfield. Um, so yeah, just some cool history, and you know we're not going to spend a long time on it, but I just wanted to kind of highlight it, and we're going to kind of do one, our, our old favorites. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try to do that every podcast because we do have quite a selection of iconic used guns to choose yes. from here. Yes, we're very fortunate. And you can and you can uh, actually handle and purchase this firearm at two barrels. There you go. Uh, so. Stuff on in. Uh, all right, folks. Well, we just about ran our course on time here. Um, Wanted to remind you again, follow us on Facebook, folks. If you want to see when we're posting our, our podcast, when we're posting our videos on YouTube, uh, what specials we have. Uh, guns like Deuce just uh, covered there, the Springfield. Uh, a lot of times we'll post those on social media if we get something very unique, cool, uh, used-wise, estate-wise, auction-wise, and then also just great inventory. I know we got in some very unique blocks the other day, and... Uh, Levi and the staff posted those on social media, uh, which, you know, you wouldn't know that we had them unless you spotted them on there or unless you came in that day. So kind of gives you a cheater to be able to go on and see what we have and what uh, what's available in the store um, and uh, gives you all the updated information. 
and that type of thing. So we thank you. We look forward to seeing you uh, on the next one. Have a good day. Keep your powder dry.